this on? Is it not push the button? I got to push the button? How about now? Yeah, yeah. Here we go. All right, folks. Welcome to our inaugural uh, Hop Talk for the 2022-2023 season. Um, for any students that are here, if you haven't signed in, make sure you sign in by the end of the day. So if you're getting the extra credit for being here, we're making sure we're getting that information to your teachers. There's also a couple other handouts at the end. Tom is going to tell you about that. Uh, um, and the last thing I'll say for students, we have all this food much more food than we need, and I know students can always use some free food. So when you're done, please load up and take as much as you can home. Anything you don't, me and the faculty, we will take home, but we don't need the food anymore. I don't need the food anymore. Uh -uh. So please, please make use of that. And they're all going to be catered like this. We'll have food like this every time. So please come on out to future Hog Talks and bring your friends. Even though that means there'll be a little less food, there's still going to be plenty to take home. So today, to kick this off, you know, when we first started this series, it was for Humanities Month, and uh, Tom Elliott came out and was our first speaker for that. Uh, he was so fantastic, and I think he only got like 30 minutes that day. I was really anxious to have him come out and talk to everybody again, especially to kick off. This is our first full season of Hawk Talks. We're, we're semi-professional now. Uh, it's, it's pretty darn exciting on my end. And hopefully, it's going to be exciting for everybody throughout the year. I am positive, though, that you're going to really enjoy this lecture. Um, I don't want to say a whole lot about Tom, because he is going to tell you quite a bit about his life. Uh, but he did get his bachelor's degree from Fort Hayes State in English. His master's is also from Fort Hayes State. He has a master of liberal studies with an emphasis in the social sciences, the longest name for a master's degree I've ever heard before. Um, but it's going to, I think, shine through in the things he's going to be talking to you about. Uh, and here at the college, just as his degree kind of is the longest thing here, um, he's an instructor of many, many things. I know the humanities, I know he does some ESL stuff, and I imagine that there's probably other things that get wedged into his schedule on a yearly basis. That being said, let's all welcome Professor Tom Elliott up to the podium. Well, that's going to be really hard to live up to. Uh, <laughs> no pressure, right? Well, thanks. Uh, so, yeah, first I guess I want to say thank you to Paul for organizing these Hawk Talks. I mean, I think it's something great to have here on our campus. Um, just, just something for the students to do and to, to bring the community together. Uh, part of what I'm going to talk about is how much I really hate to hear people say there's nothing to do around here. There's plenty, and, uh, well, welcome. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, like you said, my name's uh, Thomas Elliott, Tom. Um, and I really, when he asked me to speak about the humanities, he kind of just pitched it out there last year and said, hey, we have these talks. Do you have anything you could talk about? And I, I struggled. I, I really don't have a specialty in any specific area, maybe English, a little bit of literature, but um, I, I finally settled on the topic of why, why should people even care about the humanities, right? Like, what does it have to do with me? Why, why should I care? Uh, it doesn't affect me. I'm a, I'm a plumber. I'm a, uh, a, a lawyer. I got other stuff to do. I have a, a career. I have kids. I don't have time for all that useless humanity stuff. Um, and, and, you know, I probably started out with that same kind of opinion. I don't think I could have told you what the humanities were when I was a high school student, but uh, I can tell you I didn't like them. <laughs> uh, so, yeah, well, let's, let me just jump right in then. So the humanities, I, I do think I, I should start out by, you know, answering the question just in case, like, what are the humanities? How do you define them? And it's hard to define because it's a really broad term. Um, and, and what my students, I asked this to start off my intro to the humanities class, and what my students usually come up with something very close to this definition. And, and this is what we work with for the whole semester. But really, the humanities in all are, are the study of what makes us human. 
Like what separates us and, and makes us human? Uh, some of the individual fields that you could, you could kind of categorize as parts of the humanities, um, anything to do with society or the study of society, you know, sociology, um, history, all, uh, philosophy, any religions, uh, different cultures, culinary arts, that's one people don't think about a lot, but really, how much of our culture, and almost any culture, how much of it revolves around food? Right? That's, that's something that's very unique to humans. Um, visual arts, like the arts in general, are what people tend to think about first, and there's so many different categories. We have uh, performing arts, music, sculptural arts, and architecture, mythology, literature. I might even categorize sports in there with it. I mean, I can't think of any animals that go out and burn calories for fun. That's just not, <laughs> like, that doesn't make biological sense. Right? Um, so sports, um, and, and I'm sure there's others that I'm not thinking of. Did I mention literature here? I'm a, yeah, okay, kind of. All right, so, so now with that in mind, um, I've always said to my students, and I think I'm sure I got it from a teacher or a book somewhere, when you're writing, you should show the reader. You shouldn't tell them Tom was angry, you should show them through your words, right? Like, be, be descriptive. Um, so I really want to show this topic of, of why the humanities are so important to all of us through kind of my own personal journey. And yeah, I'm kind of a nerd. I started off with a little uh, quote from, I believe this was the, was it this the is Fellowship. It might have been, it's, it's one of the Lord of the Rings trilogy. I'm not sure which one. Fellowship. It's from the Fellowship? Okay. Yeah. Uh, it's dangerous business, Frodo, going out your door. You step onto the road, and if you don't keep your feet, there's no knowing where you might be swept off to. That's what happened to me. I kind of, one day, I was just like a little hobbit in this hole, and then uh, accidentally got taken on a journey. So, um, it, it really started out, well, I better tell you where I started before I, I start telling you about how I started to experience the humanities, because I have come quite a ways. When I was, uh, I, I was born and raised in Kansas. Uh, I finished high school in Washington, Kansas, but we bounced around to a lot of smaller communities. Washington was one of the larger ones we ended up in. And as I was researching, trying to update this, I, I found some statistics about present day Washington, Kansas. It's, it's shrunk just a little bit since then, not, not much. But uh, the population now is 1,065. And it's the largest town in the county down there, right? So uh, there's not a single fast food restaurant in the whole county. That's probably a positive. I mean, I say that like it's a bad thing. But um, not a lot of people. You can see uh, probably about a mile by a mile you can walk across town. Uh, the, the stat that I thought was interesting is they must not count it as an actual town if it's under 1,000 people maybe. But 9,996th uh, largest town in America out of 1,278. So like we're way, way down at the bottom. But that's okay because we have the sixth highest age of any town in Kansas. <laughs> so I guess it evens out. Um, but that's where I came from. Like not a diverse community. Uh, I could have shown the the, the demographics chart. Um, but everybody around there was, they, they looked like me, everybody had similar jobs, everybody knew each other, very small community. Kind of like the Shire. I mean, I'm, I'm getting more and more connections here as we go. Um, but, but, when I, you know, my, my dream from when I was young, I don't know how I kind of got this in my head that I was going to join the Army. And I, like, my first toys were Army men. My, my, you know first conversation, like people would ask me what you want to do and I didn't change my answer from the time I was two years old until I actually joined, I'm going to join the army. Um, so when I was about a month before I turned 17, I, I talked to a recruiter that came to our school and I joined the Kansas Army National Guard. Uh, they made me wait till like the day I turned 17 uh, to sign the papers. And then that summer, between my junior and senior years of college, or 
junior and senior years of high school, I went to basic training. So I, I actually did boot camp. It's called Split Up. I don't know if they still do it. But uh, I went to boot camp before I was a senior in high school. And that was an experience for a, a, another speech. Um, but yeah, there's me as a, a much, much, much younger person. Um, I was in field artillery down in Kansas. Um, and the reason I'm mentioning this, you're like, what does the Army have to do with the humanities? That's like way off track, Mr. Elliott. We're, we're getting off in the weeds. Well, I think I'd been in for a couple years. I was 18 or 19, and I didn't plan on going to college at all. That was not even in my, in my future. I was thinking I was going to transfer to full-time Army um, when the time felt right. Um, well, while I was in the Army, they, they had this, um, we have two weeks of training every summer, and we had an opportunity to do an exchange program with the Territorial Army in England. And uh, it's kind of like their version of National Guard. They took a third of our unit and sent us to England. They took a third of their unit and sent them to Kansas. They really got the short end of the stick. Um, uh, yeah, I, I'm going to go to Kansas. Hey. Um, so, so we did that. I flew over there uh, most of the time. We were there for a bit over two weeks. Most of the time I was sleeping outdoors. Uh, doing exercises with like the, the field artillery stuff, and it was all army stuff, not a lot of fun. In its own way it was. But we did have one day where they let us go out and explore, and they had some trips set up for us. So we had like this one fun day. And we went to Salisbury, England, uh, which is the town that's probably the, the biggest, the closest fairly large town next to Stonehenge. So, I went out and saw Stonehenge. It's not as cool as I thought it was. Uh, it, mm -hmm. it, 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 this is not a realistic picture. This is a picture with a zoom lens. Um, I, I think, Pam, you've probably been there, right? You've been yeah. to England a lot. I've been there several times. They don't let you get very close, right? And I hate to say it's boring. Kind of. <laughs> I mean, it was, it was like, hey, I've been to Stonehenge. <laughs> Next. <laughs> but. They don't let you go. It's all roped off. You stand way far away and see some rocks that are stacked up in a really interesting way. Um, and, but after that, we went to see Salisbury Cathedral, which, in my opinion, was way, way more impressive. Um, it, it's really hard to tell from pictures or even videos, right? But um, the architecture, first off, like even from a distance, we were walking up, I was like, you don't see that in Kansas. And we got closer, and I noticed all along every wall, every facade, around every window, there were life-size, realistically carved statues all along all of the walls. And I'm pretty sure they were of actual, real people that were alive once. And that, that was all the way around. Like, just this, the amount of work and energy and creativity that went into that, it completely blew my mind. I'm gonna use that phrase a lot tonight because my mind had been constantly blown. It's, this is like a, a best of a highlight reel of all the times my mind was blown, right? So this was one of the very first times when I just absolutely was stunned and didn't know what to think. Um, but it was only a day. We only had a day. I got to see two pretty cool things experience them briefly, um, and then it was back to the, the training, and then back on a plane, and back to Kansas. Now, I don't, I don't want to knock Kansas. I don't want to knock Nebraska. I'm not saying anything negative about the Midwest. It's a wonderful place. I, I'm happy to be here right now, but it's not the only place. And, and as a child, it felt to me like this is my life. This is what it's going to be for my entire life. Um, but I went back to Kansas. I went back to a small town in Kansas, and I found a quote that kind of summed it up by John Steinbeck. You can't go home again because home has ceased to exist except in the mothballs of memory. Like, it was the same. Nothing had really changed in the two weeks I'd been gone. As far as, like, all the buildings were the same, all the people were the same. But somehow I had changed, and I came back, and everything seemed small, constricting. Like... 
I don't, I, I don't mind being here. I like being here. It's a nice, laid-back place. I know people. I'm friend, I got friends. But now I knew there was so much more out there. And that's really part of what inspired me to apply to college, right? Um, that and uh, a really gruesome industrial accident at the uh, factory I worked for, <laughs> but that's, a, again, another, another story. Um, but I knew I, I wanted to get out and, and, and see the world. And uh, part of that, I went about three hours down the road to Hayes, Kansas. Uh, started out studying journalism, decided I don't like deadlines, uh, but I do like the writing part. <laughs> Photography's fun. Photography on a time schedule is not as fun. So I uh, uh, switched over to English after one of my, my professors said, hey, you write pretty good. You should switch to English. And I said, okay, why not? And here I am. Uh, so while I was in college, though, I, I didn't really have like a, a long-term plan. I'm like, I'm, I'm going to go to college and see what happens. First one in my family, first generation. If nobody expected me to go. I just kind of ended up there. Um, but I took these classes, and, and after that first semester, like in my second semester, I was taking some English classes, some literature classes. I took a, I don't think it was an actual just Shakespeare, but it was a class where we touched heavily on Shakespeare, and we read a little bit, watched a couple of plays, and uh, that, that was really neat. And I got to thinking it would be pretty cool to go experience some of this, uh, this stuff I'm learning about firsthand. Um, I mean, I remember when I went to England, I heard something about the Globe Theatre. I wonder if that still exists. And I looked it up, and it, it, it really technically doesn't. Um, but we'll, we'll get there. Um, the thing that really spurred me, though, when I was, when I was in college, I, like, I, I had this desire to travel. I had no money, though. <laughs> that was a problem. So I got a job. Uh, one of many jobs I had was at Holiday Inn. Um, and I found out when I was because I'm an avid reader, so I read their whole employee handbook. I don't think anybody ever does that, but I just read it <laughs> on my break for fun. I'm weird. But I saw something in there that said, you can get a hotel room at a very steep discount at any Holiday Inn, in little letters, in the world. It's not like, hey, you can go off to Kansas City and get a cheap room. It's like, in the world. Like, Where all are these Holiday Inns located? They're everywhere, including downtown London. So that was the, like the seed of this little plan. I'm like, okay, I, I could actually afford to stay there. How am I going to get there? So I taught myself to be a travel agent, and I, I did all this. This is back in the uh, early 2000s, like when travel agents were still a thing. And I, I did all this research. I, I talked to people, and I figured out how to get to England on a very, very tight budget, like for under a thousand bucks for a ticket. See, all I had to do was book, well, I already booked a hotel, really good price, and I got on a Greyhound bus in Hayes, Kansas, and took it something like 32 hours to Newark, New Jersey. <laughs> kind of a mistake. I don't regret it because it got me where I wanted to be, but your butt is sore after 32 hours on a Greyhound. And, oh, man. Anyway, we went, I went to, went to Newark. Uh, very interesting trip, very interesting people on the bus. Um, got off at Newark at the, uh, the bus station in, in Newark, New Jersey, which is not in a good part of the neighborhood. Uh, I heard gunshots when I got off, and I did not hear police sirens. Like, it, a small town Kansas guy going there, it, it, it was an experience there by itself. Then I got on an airplane and flew from Newark to London because I, I had looked at every possible connection from America where I just need to, I can get where I need to go in America and I'm gonna find the cheapest flight to get to England. So I did that. Got to England, used public transportation to get from the uh, airport in England to the hotel. And it was a nice, nice hotel. Um, I remember when I was checking out at the end, I, I, I was waiting to pay. The people ahead of me were checking in and I was checking out. They, they were just uh, getting it for one night, and it was something like 180 pounds, which is a couple hundred dollars, right? And I had stayed for, I think, 11 nights, and I was paying, and I went to pay, and it was 150 pounds for the whole thing. So it worked out really well. And it was right downtown next to a subway. 
So, I'm there. But now, I, I did have that time to prepare a little. And this time, the trip was much different. I had more than a day. That was a big part of it. But more importantly, I had done a bit of research. And I, I had taken these classes in the humanities. I, I had a little bit more knowledge behind it. So I, I knew what I was looking at this time. And like I said, the globe, it, it burned down long, long ago, and then they rebuilt it. And then I think it burned again, and then they re rebuilt it again. And now it's, it's like a very true-to-form recreation of what the original Globe Theater was like, as far as I know. Burned down in 1613. 1613. And then was pulled down during the Puritan uh, by Cromwell and his from, and then rebuilt. Okay, so kind of like the Monty Python, the first castle sank, <laughs> the second castle, yeah. Um, not a lot of people. But anyway, so, so I had learned about how these, these plays worked, and like the rich people would sit up in the top, and they would throw rotten fruit down on the peasants who stood in what they I think they call it the pit. And uh, so I wanted to be a peasant, man. I, I, I stood right there, front and center. You see two little dots right there in the stage. I was there between those dots, like, like right in the center stage. Uh, these are actually, I'm 90% I'm sure those are some of the actors that were in the troupe when I went, because the guy with the beard, not, not the guy with the makeup, because it was also like like they did in Shakespeare. There were no female actors, right? That's a guy, that's another guy. All males, because they wanted it to be as true to form as possible. And uh, the guy in the back, when he speaks, he's a great actor, but he spits when he talks. And I was front and center, and I got spit on. Luckily, it's a very rainy country. And, uh, you know, I had a poncho in my backpack because I was a tourist. I pulled the poncho <laughs> out, kind of put it on. And uh, when he walked by, I kind of subtly pulled, the, sub, subtly pulled the hood up. And uh, so he didn't spray me again. So I got, I got spit on by a Shakespearean actor. And that was fun. It was amazing. I, I saw a play called The Twelfth Night. Um, I, I, that's one that I hadn't read before, but it was really funny. Um, just a, a really cool experience. And especially knowing I was standing, it was in the same location, the same style of building. Everything was like a really faithful recreation. And then I felt like I, could, I really was experiencing a Shakespeare play on a, on a different level. And I couldn't have done that. I mean, I could have gone to the play without knowing anything about it, got the tickets up top and just watched it, but like, yeah, cool, I saw Shakespeare. But with that little bit of knowledge, it, it really made me appreciate it on a deeper level. And then, you know, some things I didn't plan. And this is where I'm going to go off my, my script a little bit because a lot of you might have heard today that the Queen of England died, uh, Queen Elizabeth. Somehow I accidentally timed this second trip to coincide with the Golden Jubilee, the 50-year anniversary of her reign. So this is about 20 years ago. And they had a parade go through town with this solid gold, gold carriage pulled by a bunch of really fancy-looking horses. And I was like, I was from me to the food, or closer than me to the food, to the Queen of England at one point while she was going by. Mostly, there were so many people, mostly I just saw the tall hats marching by, and then I kind of saw an old lady waving. It was really cool, though. It was, it was like, I, I was just hap happened to be downtown at the time where the parade was going through, and I asked somebody, what's going on? And they're like, the, the Jubilee. I'm like, cool, what, what's a Jubilee? <laughs> So they, they figured out as a tourist. They told me, I'm like, oh, all right, great. Then we went on the London Eye, and uh, as we got to the top, there's this giant Ferris wheel, right? And as we got to the top, they did this flyover with fighter jets and like all the England colors going over with the smoke. I'm like, wow, it's almost like I planned it, but I didn't. It was just really amazing coincidence. Um, that's my story about the Queen of England. I just had to toss that in there because it really fit uh, so well with what I was talking about. That was a, a happy little accident, as Bob Ross would say. Uh, but another accident that, that turned out really well, and this is, this is I, I appreciated it so much more because I had had this little bit of background, and not, not a ton. I was still like, I was, this was just after my freshman year of college, and I would had a class in literature, a, a single class. I had a world, liter, world literature class, and then another class, maybe, maybe two. But... Uh, I was in the British Museum of Art, and there's a statue there. 
And I, I was walking by and I looked at the statue and I looked down at the, the, the plaque on the statue and it said Ozymandias. I'm like, whoa, wait a minute. And I looked at the plaque and I remembered that my professor, uh, his name was Dr. Trout, one of my favorite professors ever. He's also a Willa Cather scholar, with Nebraska Connection. But he told us a story about two poets, uh, Percy Shelley and Horace Smith. I'm not going to try to pronounce his uh, middle name there. Um, but, but actually, Percy Shelley was the husband of uh, uh, the Shelley that wrote Frankenstein. Mary Shelley. Uh, Mary Shelley, yeah. But anyway, he's, he's a fairly well-known uh, poet. Horace Smith might be. But this, this particular thing, they said, let's have a competition. Let's have a little contest between the two of us. We're going to pick something kind of random. We're both going to write a poem about it, and we'll see which one's better. So they picked this statue. They, had, like, they were going through like this period of fascination with like Egyptian stuff, and so like, as a society, and uh, they, they picked this statue. Um, I think the actual statue is Tutankhamun. Uh, has anybody ever heard the poem Ozymandias? I'm betting you have. I'm betting you have. How many of you have seen the, the TV show Breaking Bad? Oh no. All right, I'm done. <laughs> That's one of the best shows ever. I highly recommend it. It is awesome. Uh, Brian Cranston, but, but they actually had an episode named Ozymandias. And at the beginning of that, well, here we go. Now we get to see if my sound works. And my technological skills. Go. Come on, Internet. Okay, so can you pull it up on YouTube? That's what it should be doing. Let me switch apps. Uh, anyway, okay, Ozymandias, boy. Uh, yeah, streaming off the phone right on there. That's open YouTube quickly. <laughs> See, that's another thing you learn uh, as a teacher is to be very flexible and always have a backup plan. There we go. And I'm guessing it's going to play an advertisement for this. I'm really not chilling for. Uh, Solely our vitamins. <laughs> Six seconds. Bear with me. Bear with me. You guys know you do that. But they just want to make us healthy. That's all they want to do, Tom. It's not like they want our money. Stood. It was just sand, 
like he'd been forgotten in time. It, it, it's just this, this really, this poem that really made me think when I read it. And then here I am in the British Museum of Art and I see this statue that the poem was based on. And I mean, I stood there for probably 20 minutes just like looking at it and, and like, this is kind of pre-smartphone. I didn't have a smartphone, or I would have looked up the poem and reread it. I was like, "Wow, that's amazing!" I took a bunch of pictures, and that was back when we had film, and they've since been lost. But anyway, uh, so so I had that experience that that if I wouldn't have known about that poem, if I wouldn't have had that class and that exposure to the uh, to the the poem itself, I would have just walked by and been like, "Huh, oh, that's a cool statue," and kept going, right? But but with that knowledge came a, came a little bit more appreciate a lot more appreciation of what I was looking at. Oh sure now I bet it works. Oh, okay. Alright, so again after that um, we're gonna fast forward a bit. I, I obviously uh, well okay I'm getting ahead. What was different about that trip, the first and second trip, besides the time and the planning that I had it was really that, that before I went on the trip, I had developed this curiosity. And that curiosity led me to school. Uh, it, it motivated me to go learn a little bit about what I'd seen on that first trip. And as I was learning about that, I learned about so much more. And then all of this new knowledge made me think, well, now I gotta go back again, and I did. And then those experiences kind of just created this that just fueled this desire in me to keep on learning and keep on exploring the world and, and the different types of humanities. Uh, so I went back to college, because you know that's, that's what you have to do if you're a freshman. <laughs> and uh, I finished my degree, got my, my, uh, my bachelor's in English, and then I, I had also finished, probably about a year before I finished college, I decided, okay, I'm not gonna sign back up for the National Guard. They helped me pay for part of college. Uh, but my time came up and I didn't sign back up because I knew it was the Kansas Army National Guard. One weekend a month, two weeks a year, I would have to be back in Kansas. I didn't want to tie myself down. Didn't know where I wanted to go. <laughs> and I ended up tying myself down to Kansas for another year accidentally. Uh, I signed up for AmeriCorps VISTA, which is a, um, a program. It's a volunteer program. It doesn't pay much. It gives you a little bit of a stipend, just whatever poverty level is, plus like 5%. So it wasn't making a bunch of money. Right? I did that for a year. That finished. Um, I was back in that small town, Washington, Kansas, doing grant writing. When that came up, I was looking for a job. And I had met this guy at college, good friend of mine, and <laughs> that is another kind of long story. We switched places. I was into Dungeons and Dragons, and I got him into Dungeons and Dragons. We applied for the same job, working for Dungeons and Dragons. Um, I applied for it first, and I made the mistake, but well, I, 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 I'm happy that I told my friend about it, and we both applied. They got, they called him back. He got a second interview. I was like, oh, good for him, whatever. Then he got a third interview. I'm like, oh, wow, that's, that's cool. Then he got a fourth interview where they flew him to Seattle, and he interviewed in their headquarters, and then he got the job. If you go to Barnes & Noble now, Logan Bonner, uh, there's a game called Pathfinder. They have literally an entire bookshelf dedicated to Pathfinder at Barnes & Noble in Sioux City. I was there a few weeks ago. His name is on every book on that bookshelf. <laughs> so he kind of took over my life. <laughs> what he had planned on before he applied to that job was to go to China and teach. Remember, remember that. Okay, so he's like, well, I'm going off to Seattle to work at that your dream job, Tom. So, uh, But my original plan was to go to Lake Scott, where my parents have a cabin. They're archaeologists, so he's also a really cool guy. Uh, and I went out to Western Kansas, where he was going to work, and stayed at his parents' cabin near a lake. And I, I picked up garbage at the lake and cleaned bathrooms all summer. Not as bad as it sounds. I was outdoors. Beautiful job. <laughs> but that was what his. We, we, we literally switched lives. It was so bizarre. Um, so he's in China. I am there at the lake. Summer job. Summer ends. And I'm like, hmm, I don't know what I'm going to do. I have an English degree. My summer job finished, and they said, well, sorry, we're, we're done. We don't have any more work. And I said, okay. And I got a part-time job at a liquor store while I was trying to figure out what to do. I had a college professor call me up and say, hey, we, we need somebody to teach in China. Have you ever thought about teaching in China? And I said, no, I've never thought about teaching. And I've never thought about going to China. Um, 
And they're like, well, we need somebody there next week, because our first choice backed out, and then our second and third choices were busy, and then we called you. Uh, we really hope you can do this. <laughs> hey, That's encouraging. I, you know what? I, I'll take it. Because it took me to China. Uh, they're like, uh, like oh, I'm not, I got no plans. Let me think about it. Called them back in the morning and said, I have this passport that I used once to go to England. <laughs> well, twice uh, to go to England. Maybe, maybe only once because the first time I don't think I needed it with the guard. Anyway, I had this passport. It was good for 10 years. I still had a few years left on it. thought, well, let's go to China and work. So, literally 10 days later after that phone call, just cold call out of nowhere, I'm in China. Didn't speak a word of Chinese. I actually studied, how are we doing on time, by the way? I, I had studied some Chinese in this little guidebook on the way, uh, and I, I learned the first 10 numbers wrong, <laughs> because the pronunciation in Chinese is way different, and I was like pronouncing the, the word, like number four is, uh, uh, so, and it's as I. And I like I study some Spanish. I'm like ah, si. I was saying <laughs> I was saying si, and, and and that doesn't mean anything in Chinese. I don't think, uh, but it doesn't mean four. So when I was trying to buy something to drink, it sure didn't help my my communication. Uh, but I studied it right away. I got to China, and I'm like I I had an open mind about going to China. Like it's going to be a new country. Um, so I was thinking I you know. I'm going to explore, I'm going to figure this out. The bigger culture shock to me, though, was going from rural Kansas, um, actually Hayes, Kansas, which is a, roughly the size of Norfolk, bigger, smaller, bit, I don't know. But it's a college town, to a city of 8 million. And uh, like Nebraska, how many, what's the population of Nebraska? Like 3 point something? 2 million? 2.9. 2.9. 1.9. Okay, so like Kansas and Nebraska put together and, and crammed into a city, right? That's where I went. That was the culture shock. Uh, um, so you can see my journey took me from that, that town where there were more cows than people to a city of a million. And, and I got there, and there, it was new culture. It was new food. And I think my, my education, and especially my travel before this, um, and my background in the humanities have really prepared me for that. Um, I explored the new culture, the food, the new language. The whole society has a different philosophy and a different way of working, has different art and history and architecture and music. You know, I experienced that. I didn't say I like it. Like the, the Beijing Opera has some really jarring sounds. I'm not a huge fan. But like some of the art, like the paper cuttings and the, uh, um, just like the, the watercolors that they do on the scrolls, I, they're beautiful. Uh, so when I was there, I made it kind of a point to exchange my culture, teach the students like the culture I came from, and learn about theirs. Uh, for example, I introduced some, some of my friends in China to turkey. That's not really a thing in China. Like, it's weird. They, they just don't eat much turkey, or any turkey in most places. The word for turkey in Chinese is fire chicken. <laughs> that's, that's the direct translation. They're like... It's a bird, it looks like a chicken with its tail on fire. We're going to call it a fire chicken. So, uh, it's very ironic because like six or seven years in, I was at a different school and I was trying to cook a turkey that I, they're not easy to get. But I got one because I'm a foreigner in a different land and, and I wanted to have a turkey for Thanksgiving, dang it. And I got one, I was trying to cook it in this kind of pizza oven and I literally caught it on fire. <laughs> uh, oh boy, my in-laws had fun with that. Uh, lots of jokes with the word fire chicken involved. Anyway, but, but then like one holiday, like at Christmas, there was no way to find a turkey. Like you could find it in a special, like one location in the city of 8 million. If you booked it a couple weeks ahead of time before Thanksgiving, you could get a turkey imported and pay a lot of money, like 200 bucks. But we got turkeys and we shared it. Uh, but like Christmas, I couldn't get a turkey, and I couldn't really, at that point, I couldn't cook. I'm, I'm going to get to that point. Uh, somebody brought that up to me today. This is Beijing duck, and uh, that's a lot easier to get in, you know, Beijing. <laughs> so uh, that's a, a Chinese fancy meal that they might have at like a holiday. And, and uh, my wife introduced me to that and said, you know, we can't have a Christmas turkey and we can't like a big ham like you have at home but try this and we did it was awesome that's what that was our Christmas dinner 
the year before my daughter was born, so about 14, 14 years ago. Um, so, so I experienced their holidays. I introduced my holidays. Uh, talking about cooking, I mentioned culinary arts, right? When I went to China, I didn't know how to cook. I had, uh, you know, I, I could burn water at that point. Like macaroni and cheese was the the, the fancy dinner that I had in my back pocket when I needed it. Uh, craft, not homemade. And but when I got to China, like Chinese food's great. I loved it, but. After a while, you start to miss that food from your home, right? And they have all these wonderful outdoor markets, and you, you can go out and get all these fresh vegetables and these, these great, wonderful, fresh ingredients. And I, I love to explore, so I knew where all these open markets were. You get stuff for cheap, and it's so fresh. And so I was like, maybe I, you know, if I want to eat something, I'm going to have to learn how to cook it. So I got on the internet, and I taught myself how to cook. And I have to say, I'm good at eating, and, and I like to eat, so I taught myself how to cook well. Um, Thanksgiving, how many of you have had like uh, uh, green bean casserole? Mm -hmm. Kind of a staple, right? Mm -hmm. You know how to make that, right? Anybody can do it. You, you take a can of cream of mushroom, bag of frozen green beans, mix them together, throw it in the oven. Maybe put some of those uh, uh, fried onions on the top that you buy in a package, right? You can't get any of that in China. You can get fresh green beans. You can buy whole uh, fresh cream. <laughs> And you can buy mushrooms, you can get all the ingredients, but putting it together, I had to figure out myself. So I made like cream of mushroom soup out of cream and, and mushrooms, and I learned how to make something called a, a roux. I think that's how you pronounce it. I don't even know. I've only seen it written down. I've never heard somebody say it. But but I, I made the cream of mushroom. I, I bought fresh green beans and peeled the strings off. I guess you have to do that, or they're really stringy. And, and, and I, I learned how to fry onions. Slice them really thin, soak them in milk. I, I taught myself that. Um, because I had that open mind and that approach. I lived with, with people in China, also expats that were from other countries. They were miserable because they would just eat what they could get at the local fast food restaurant where you could point at the food you wanted and, and give them a number and they would give you the food and that's what they lived on. I, I adapted and I learned how to, to make my own food and I learned how to make Chinese food and I cook Chinese food all the time here now. Uh, we also introduced them to, uh, this is my daughter and I, I'm a pirate here in this picture. You can't see my eye patch, it's on the other one. Um, we, we introduced our students to uh, Halloween, right? My daughter is not literally a princess, she thinks she is. Uh, that's my fault. I'm not really a pirate unless you count like back in the you know early 2000s with the uh, movies, it was hard to buy them in China. Um, but but we, we taught them about Halloween, introduced our culture to them, and they taught me about like some of their festivals. This isn't really a, a holiday, it's more of an event. Harbin China, the ice festival, it is like one of the wonders of the world in my opinion. Um, everything you see in that picture, including like the 14-story lighthouse, is made 100% of ice. Except maybe like the electronics, but like that's a working lighthouse with a light in the top. The whole building is made out of ice. Um, you can't see it in this picture, but off in the back, there's a bunch of snow sculptures that some of them would barely fit in this room. Just like these massive snow sculptures. Um, all, all these blocks of ice, they, they, they prepare this for, for months ahead. They, they put the lights inside the ice and freeze it around the lights. And uh, it was absolutely amazing. Again, my mind was blown once again. Um, they had like snowmobiles, and I, I went to that. That was a, definitely a highlight of my 10 years in China. Uh, my hobby while I was there was just going around and exploring, learning new stuff, experiencing new things. This is me on the Great Wall of China over here. Uh, this is me right behind the uh, Forbidden City, uh, in the middle of Beijing, Tiananmen Square. I mean, I know it has kind of a dark history. There's like a, a chapter of, of history that we all know about. Uh, but actually, it's also kind of a cultural center of China. Uh, the, the government buildings are all on one side of the square, and there's temples, and there's like the ancient city walls around it. Um, here is me on a sleeper train. It's the way you get around in a lot of other countries. You take a train across the country instead of flying. Like I took a 17 or 18 hour train, and I slept on the train. That was a lot of fun. Um, it's just a, definitely a new experience. 
Now here, I'm going to show this picture right back there. I don't know how clearly you can see it, but there's some buildings. I lived in one of those high-rise buildings, probably about the, I think it was the 14th floor. Um, and this picture, I am somewhere right down here sitting on a rock in this picture. So, so here, I'm at the top of those mountains in the other picture, because I'd always see them out of my window in that 14th story. I'd, I'd look out and I'd see those mountains. I'm like, I wonder what's over there. I wonder if you could just like walk up to the top. I mean, nobody's going to stop me. And if they do, I don't speak any Chinese really, so I won't know what they're saying. So I, I went, I walked up to the top, and there, there's me at the top. It was, it was an experience. I was tired. Um, and then, like some of the experiences, like just these fresh new experiences that I, I never had considered. Uh, this is called Baguar, Chinese cupping. Anybody ever seen that? Anybody heard of Michael Phelps, like the swimmer? He's really into this. A lot of NFL players, pro athletes do this. I don't know if it does any good. I just thought it was interesting and fun. I still do it once in a while, but they, they take these cups. They're like jars. They spray some alcohol in it, and then they light it on fire and slam it up against your back. When the fire goes out, it creates this suction, like a lot of suction. <laughs> it leaves a bruise. It's kind of... Not, not to be crude, but it's kind of like a, a 15 hickeys on your back. It's, it's, <laughs> it's, uh, it's an interesting experience. And you're laying there on a the table, and every time you like you adjust, you like, hear this clank, clank, clank of these jars knocking together. <laughs> but I tried it, and it, you know, I felt better afterwards. I might go home and do that tonight. <laughs> uh, I have a kit. It's not, we don't light it on fire. My wife wouldn't let me buy that one <laughs> for some reason. But it's, it's like I got a little vacuum gun and a hose and you pop it off and like you, so I have one at home. Uh, down here, this is a night market. It, these are pretty normal. You, you've seen crawdads in, in Nebraska if you're from around the Midwest. Uh, but over there, it's the same night market. Those are scorpions on a stick. And kind of in the background, those are centipedes. Uh, they like, they, they were cooking them, like deep frying them. I ate one. I didn't die. It was just kind of crunchy and not a lot of taste, a little oily, crunchy taste, like popcorn kernel shells, but hey, I ate one. Uh, also tarantulas, There's, I did not eat a tarantula, I do not like spiders. Um, here, here's just like a cultural place we went, uh, that's my wife and daughter back there, and this was just like a photo op, and we, you know, I, I picked up the little, uh, I don't even know what it's called, but that's the way that emperors would get around back in ancient, ancient China. And then, and then uh, here's a slide made entirely out of ice. This is like a huge, like probably three or four story ice slide at that Harbin Ice Festival. We went up to the top and slid down and it was fun. Um, and then probably the most interesting and unexpected cultural issue I faced in China was the toilets. Um, they don't have toilets generally that you sit on in China. They have something called squatty potties because you squat. Uh, it's good for your hamstrings and your glutes and your, your quads. Uh, but it's a challenge trying to figure that thing out for the first time, especially when you have urgent business to take care of. <laughs> um, I took a look at that and like scratched my head a bit. I, 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 I figured it out the first time, and then I went and checked on Google and I had to watch a tutorial. <laughs> uh, but I'm quite good at it now. I can, you know. In, if you ever go, I, I would suggest studying up before you go. If you don't have time to do that, you're going to have to use the one leg method where you remove one leg of your pants and hold it out this way. Uh, anyway, we won't get into more details on that. Uh, it was a good 10 years in China. It was, it was amazing. But a lot of other instructors that were there burn out. I saw people come and go. They would come for a year, a half a year, maybe two months, and, and they'd be like, no, I can't handle this. This is just... Too overwhelming. It's too different. I I, I got to get back, and then they go back to Canada or Australia or America or wherever they were from. And somehow I stuck it out ten years. Not stuck it out. I enjoyed the ten years. I met my wife there. That's definitely part of the reason. But but I loved it there, um, exploring new cultures. And uh, we traveled. We went while we were there. I didn't have time to put this in. We went to Thailand. Uh, spent a couple days in uh, Japan one time. Uh, we, we got around and, and traveled all over China. Lots of pictures I couldn't fit in here. Um, and then that leads me back to today. Right, really to the point of my story. 
And, and you're, you're thinking, wow, this is like all that, and then you came back to the Midwest, really? Like, I thought you were tired of Kansas. Well, no, no, it wasn't that I was tired of Kansas. It's, I went out and explored the world, and now, you know, I'm back. And it's, I, I love Norfolk, Nebraska. I, this is my home now, and I'm, I'm super proud of that. And, and it really drives me crazy to hear people say, there's nothing to do in Nebraska. There's nothing to do around here. Norfolk is so boring. What are we going to do? It's just like, why be here? Well, me, when I came back, now that I have that background in the humanities, I'm back here. I am surrounded by people who work in the humanities. I've got, you know, just people I work with. i got Paul, the history instructor, Adam Peterson, and Nina Buck, uh, theater instructors here at the high school. Um, she's married to the person I share an office with. Um, my entire department is the literature, English people. Um, you know, Michael Lynch over here teaches art and, and so many other instructors with all these diverse, interesting backgrounds that I get to hang out with. Um, I have all of my students of such diverse backgrounds. Even, you know, you know, I have local students who are just as interesting, but I have students from Malawi. I have one class this semester with half of Europe. Like, I have five different guys from five different European countries. It's awesome. They're all soccer players. Uh, shout out to the soccer team. They are, both teams are doing awesome this year. Um, but, but, you know, I get to experience that culture just even coming to work every day, which is amazing for me. You can find the humanities wherever you are. That's one of my main points. Like here at Northeast, and, and there's so much I left off of here, this is just a, a quick highlight of the things that popped into my head that I am familiar with. But we have individual classes. Pam and I both teach a class called Intro to the Humanities. Some of you, one of you, is in that class. Um, but, but then there's so many others that are parts of majors, right? I looked through the list of majors here. We have art, you know, it's more like the, the, the visual arts and sculpture and stuff. Uh, culinary arts, English, global studies, graphic design, library and information services. Uh, I definitely consider that part of the humanities, right? Um, Media arts, I put a couple pluses there because there's multiple branches of media arts that you can major in. Psychology, social sciences, social work, theater, which uh, I think musical theater is the other new major. Um, so all that is here for you to focus on if, if that's your thing. Uh, but we also have so many student organizations and clubs going on on campus uh, with, with diverse groups of people. We have things like this Hawk Talk right here that's going on. Uh, we have visiting writers. Uh, one of the other instructors on my floor, uh, Bonnie Johnson Barty, is putting on. Uh, she's not having a bunch of visiting writers come throughout the semester this year. She's having a really big one-time shebang with the. Uh, it's the poetry. What's the official name for it? The, it it's like a big poetry day. It's a poetry it's a festival. Event. Type poetry song. festival, I think. Yeah. Uh, between here and Wayne, they're going to have like all of these famous poets come in from all over Nebraska and, and outside of Nebraska, and it's just going to be a great time. Um, and, and that's just here on the college. And, and one thing I want to definitely point out, like as a student here, I got a lot of students. We have these classes uh, that are travel opportunity classes. Uh, there's been some in the past. I eventually would like to turn Intro to the Humanities into one of these. That would be that would be a lot of fun. But. Uh, They've taken trips to Austria, Canada, the Czech Republic, Costa Rica, England, France, Italy, Spain, Ireland, Scotland, and Greece. And that list is just growing. I would like to add uh, a couple to that. Um, so the next one that's coming up that I know of, uh, you see these flyers all over campus. Has anybody picked one up and looked at it? You take a three credit hour class next semester, that class is going on, sign up for that class next semester, take the class, get three college credits, pass the class, I think that's probably a requirement, and, and then take another one credit hour at the beginning of the summer, and that one credit hour is actually your trip. There's like a, there's a fee involved, but I think if you sign up early, is that filled up yet? No, I don't no, think so. No, if you sign up early, you get $500 off, and so it's less than $4,000 at that point uh, to go see several different countries on like a really uh, guided tour and then you'll get that background you'll get that background on what you're going to go see before you see it and trust me you, you will appreciate it on such a deep level and it's going to be an experience you would remember your whole life i'm not trying to give you the hard sell on this but we have these opportunities and that's so awesome that, that that's there as an option 
Um, and then a little more in general, Northeast Community College is here, but we're also part of Norfolk. We're part of a wider community. And uh, we have the Norfolk Arts Center, which is amazing. And they have, they have activities going on there all the time. They have rotating exhibits that go through something new to see. If you go back every month, you'll see something different. Um, like uh, this weekend, they have a Pride Festival going on. A um, bunch of people hopefully will be out there on Saturday. Uh, then we have the, uh, I didn't know about this one, the Norfolk Area Concert Association. They put on, they bring in musicians, like different styles, and, and they go to the Johnny Carson Theater, and they have these performances. You can sign up for like multiple events and, uh, and, and get these musical experiences. We have the community theater, which is absolutely amazing. Like, I saw a show last year called Noises Off, one of the best shows I've ever seen live. I've seen a few, but that one just blew, it blew my mind. I, I saw Shakespeare in the Globe, okay? And this, this, what the performance the Norfolk Community Theater put on was right up there with that. And that's, that's pretty high praise. Um, then the Elkhorn Valley Museum, you know, get some local history, some history about Nebraska. The Norfolk Public Library is an awesome resource. They, they can put you in touch with so many other um, organizations and experiences, and they have their own that they host. My daughter goes to a creative writing uh, thing once a month over at the Norfolk, and, and she loves it, man. They, she, she was sore the next day because her sides hurt from laughing so much at this creative writing thing. We have our head librarian here. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Jessica Chamberlain over there. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> and, and then there's more. Um, I actually have one of the handouts here. I figured out how to do QR codes. I'm so proud of myself. Uh, I'm an old man and I figured out QR codes. But grab one of those little flyers there and I put the website for all these things and a couple others like right on there. You can scan it with your phone and it'll take you right to the page. Uh, so all of these are available right here in Norfolk. Uh, and then if you want to go as far as Omaha, my wife... She doesn't know this yet, but she's going to get me for my birthday. She's going to get me tickets to a show called Les Mis uh, that's going to be happening in uh, the beginning of March. Like, a couple, like the first couple weeks in March, they're going to have, have a show. I've seen the movie. It was amazing. I want to see the live performance, so she's going to take me. Where am I going with all this? Okay, it's been, been a long hour, but, but what, what's the point? My point is, the humanities are all around us. They're everywhere. And they're not limited to English professors. They're not limited to history teachers. They're for everybody. We're all human, right? And the humanities are what makes us human. And you shouldn't just be a passive observer in your own life. Don't just like go through as like a passenger in life. You are in control. You can go see all of the things that you've seen in this slide. You can, except Queen Elizabeth, but you, you can go see all of these things. First hand, you can go there, you can do it. You can go to Italy and Spain. Nothing is stopping you. I, I was a broke college student and I made it happen. First generation broke college student that worked part-time at a holiday inn. Come on. I made it there. I'm sure any of you can. And, and be curious. Always have an open mind. Don't go in thinking, like I've seen people travel that will go to McDonald's for all their meals. Like, go in with an open mind, try new things, right? Be a lifelong learner. That's what that means. That's what I try to do every day. And just fully embrace the human experience and, and all of the humanities that go into that. Um, so, like, like in conclusion, the, the humanities, I teach my students, don't say that in speech. Don't say in conclusion. That's, like, that's redundant. So, anyway, in conclusion. <laughs> the humanities are what makes us human. They're also what makes being human an enjoyable experience. So, go out and enjoy it. Thank you. Right on one hour. I'm, I'm, that, uh, that, I didn't mean to do that. So we're going to open up the floor for questions. I have a question. Yeah, I'm, I'm open. Ask me anything about China. I might not be able to answer, but I'll, I'll give it my best. So, you know, the, the point of the lecture, or the point of what you, you've just been talking to us about, is that studying the humanities can enrich the world around us. Yeah, at any level, whether it's just like one class or whether it's it's your major and, and what you focus on, but but any even if you self teach yourself, you don't have to get a degree. Well, so that was going to be my question. You know, college is expensive, and you know, I just want to go to college so I can get a good job. I don't plan on traveling anywhere. Do I really need like? What's the point of it? Can't I just go and explore on my own? 
why do that in a classroom? The why short answer is you can. And, and some people, you know, that might be their answer. Like, you go to the public library. that You can learn so much about the humanities on your own on the public li at the public library if that's the way that you learn and that's your thing. But I, I would go back, way, way back. I don't know how fast I can scroll here. Ooh. Yeah, there we go. Like, where I talk about that cycle of, of more knowledge leads to more curiosity. Like, just a lot of us aren't just motivated to go out on our own to the library, grab a book on, on you know, early 17th century architecture in Spain, right? That, that's just not going to happen for some of us. So, but if you take a class, you're going to be exposed to these things that you didn't have any clue even existed, right? You're going you're gonna to have a light shined on, on these topics and things that, you know, you might not have ever been exposed to without that professor that, that knew about it. I wouldn't have maybe read the poem Ozymandias if I wouldn't have had that class. Probably would not have. No, and it is kind of a, I mean, until, until Breaking Bad, it wasn't like a super well-known poem unless you were an English major. Please go home and look that up and read it. It's hard to spell, but Google will help you out. Um, but no, yeah, take a class. Like, Intro to the Humanities is a great starting point. Or maybe you already know you're into theater. Go take one of Adam's classes. Maybe you kind of enjoyed art in high school. It's not going to be your major. You're going to be a nurse, but go take an art class. Nurses need hobbies, too. Probably more than anyone. My sister's a nurse, and boy, does she have a stressful life. I think she should pick up, like, oil painting or something. So yeah, great question. Come on guys, you got more than that. Like, what was the food like in China? It was really good. How did the Chinese feel about Americans? Ooh, you know they loved us, actually. You know, you think that it feels like there's a lot of animosity now, but the people on the street, they, they're just, a, people are people. Everywhere you go, people are people, we're all human. It's easy to watch TV and say, oh, those people. But when you meet somebody face to face and realize that, hey, this is just another person with you know, a family and a job, and they're just going out buying groceries like I do. They're just getting through life. And, and you interact with somebody on that basic human level, people are people. And, and everywhere has good people, everywhere has bad people. But in general, I was treated wonderfully in China. And studying the humanities, you don't have to go to China to necessarily learn that because you can learn it just from studying other people. Oh, absolutely. But the college experience, we have such a diverse campus here. Um, make friends with the person next to you. Look around. We've got foreign students all over the place. But you had said people are people no matter where you go. And people here in America certainly can hold prejudices and have their own negative thoughts of people from other countries. What are the, uh, there's got to be some stereotypes of Ooh, Americans in you're China. You're putting me on the spot here. I think we're all fat. And that might be my fault. <laughs> is that is that really one? I've only worn or something I've ever met. And they're like, ooh, that's yeah, I knew it. <laughs> no, uh, you weren't repping us. <laughs> I, I well, it was in a way. Uh, <laughs> but uh, no, I mean they 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 have their stereotypes like we do. But like I said, once you meet them in person, I think the best cure for prejudice, the best cure for racism, the best cure for ignorance of any form, is to travel and experience. Like until. Yeah, I was in the army, and I have to say, it was I was in the National Guard during 9/11, and talk about an intense few days. I mean, I was sleeping. Somebody woke me up and said somebody just crashed a plane into one of the uh, twin towers. I was like, "Whoa, that sucks!" And I went back to sleep. And then they woke me up and said, "Like, no, this is like this was not an accident. The other tower just got hit." And I'm like, "What? Whoa! Okay, I'm waking up. <laughs> I know people that were there know that. Was that like noon? Yeah, I was a college student, but." Whoa, I, I got a call that afternoon, like, hey, our unit is on alert. Get your bags packed and be ready to go on 24 hours notice. And I'm like, okay, wow. I did it. We, did, we, didn't act, we got activated, and we were, we were training in Missouri, ready to go at a moment's notice. Uh, but, but part of this is the culture of the time, especially being in the Army, I had some, some opinions and ideas about Islam and Islamic people. And I'm not proud of it today because I know I was completely wrong. And, and it, it's way more about the individual, no matter what the religion is, than it is about a religion or a culture. But at the time, I didn't realize that. Even though I was in college, and I thought I had an open mind. I had these prejudices. When I got to China, I worked with a guy named Michael Abood. He was uh, born in 
uh, the Middle East, uh, and he immigrated to Canada. And I swear, he's one of the nicest guys I ever worked with. This guy literally, literally gave somebody the shirt off his back one time because they tore their shirt and they bled on it a little bit. And he's like, here, take mine. I've got an extra in the office. And he took the shirt off of his back and gave it to this, this student. And, uh, and, and then he walked with no shirt on through a couple hallways of giggling students, like, look at the foreigner. He's so hairy. And watching it, like, he suffered. That was kind of humiliating. He gave the guy the shirt off his back. And, and that was one of the, the coolest guys I ever worked with. And that made me realize, hey, people are people. You know? and, and, and working with different people, being in school with different people, that's the cure for racism and ignorance, right? Because, I mean, the, the, the people that are the, the worst with, with the strongest opinions tend to be the people that have never met somebody different than they are. And uh, traveling, exploring the world, taking college classes are ways to do that, to open your mind and realize, hey, you know, not everything I thought before is true. Like, they're just normal people like me. So, hope that answered. That was, that was an intense question, man. Whew. He's putting me on the spot. Somebody got a softball question for me? Do they have ice cream in China? Were the local animals like in China? Ooh, okay, wow. So, funny story, my wife is absolutely terrified of animals of any sort because she grew up in a city of 8 million people. Animals weren't around. The only animals I saw in Shenyang were rats. And they were sick rats because you don't generally see rats unless there's something wrong with them and they're running around during the day. And they were big and scary, but... I didn't, like, pets, like, some people had some cats and dogs, but it's not a popular thing over there in China, especially when I was there. Um, now, when I went to Guangzhou, uh, let me see if I, yeah, I was walking through these fields here, and if anybody wants to ask me about poverty, I, I can use this picture, too. But I was walking, it wasn't this day, I had my daughter on my shoulders, we were taking a hike through, somewhere around this lake right here, actually. There's a path that goes around that little lake, you can kind of see it in the background there. I was walking along with my daughter, and I was wearing sandals, um, and which was don't don't hike in sandals. That's not smart. But I felt something go across my foot. It was a giant snake. And I had never thought to look up. Are there poisonous snakes in this part of China? <laughs> I didn't know what it was. I screamed very loudly, very shrilly. People that were looking from far away probably thought it was my daughter that screamed, who was about four years old at the time. <laughs> but I screamed and about threw my name. There's my daughter right there, fresh out of Taekwondo. Uh, which is Korean, not Chinese. Um, yeah, I about tossed her in the lake because I was going to run. <laughs> Fight off the snake, honey, I'm gone. Um, there, were, there were some other animals there. There was like, you know, a, a, lot, of, a lot of insects. The mosquitoes were insane. First day I got there, before my wife was, was going to come in a little bit later, I went to like get the apartment all ready. Brand new apartment, I walk in, I, I'm opening up the curtains, and as I move the curtain, a cockroach the size of the palm of my hand was staring at me. And I, again, I screamed like a little girl. And uh, I, I'm not saying like little girls scream a lot, I'm saying my voice was literally shrill and high like a little girl. Ah! And uh, got rid of that. And so, so that was, uh, I didn't see a ton of animals because there were so many people. Like, you would be just amazed by how dense the population in China is. Um, so, so I didn't get to experience a lot of animals. The plant life was really amazing. Like elephant ear plants, you can buy those here. You can't plant them outside. They grew wild in the ditch there. They'd have leaves as big as a person. You could like use it as a blanket. Just beautiful, tropical weather. That was south at Guangzhou, and I also lived in the north part for about five years where it's snow and much colder than here even. So yeah, good question. I wish I could answer more. Like Sichuan, I never lived there, I never went there, but they're famous for pandas, that's where pandas come from. And then some parts in the south, I did take a trip um, where a friend of my daughter's classmate, okay, my daughter's classmate's grandmother made friends with my wife, and then we ended up going to visit her. What was the name of that, uh, that town, that province? Guilin. Guilin, very famous for these like really cool rock formations. There's a monkey that would like come up to their house every day and like they'd toss it food and it would sit there and it's just that little monkey that would come up. <laughs> it was pretty cool. But I was never in that cool part of China. Yeah, good question. Was the Chinese food like that? Was it fed to them from actual Chinese? 
Chinese food was vastly different. Like even even okay, China is kind of like America. It's very very diverse. I mean, people don't realize that it's it's as big north and south and east and west. Like they got cold spots, they got tropical spots. They've got places with good food, like the northeast where I'm from, where where my wife's from. They cook dumplings. Uh, we call them pot stickers here. They're usually steamed or boiled though, not fried. Like you get an IV. Once IV are pretty good. Um, they don't have fortune cookies. That's that's a California thing. That was invented at a restaurant in California. Uh, fortune cookies don't exist in China. They thought that was funny. I brought some back as like gifts for my Chinese friends when I went back. Um, they they don't have crab rangoon. Doesn't that's not really a thing. Maybe in Hong Kong they have something vaguely similar, but they're not really fans of cheese in China. Uh, they 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 don't do cheese. They don't bake. Like they don't have ovens in people's houses. They, they, they use stovetops and steam, uh, boil, fry, uh, sometimes barbecue outdoors, like on sticks, but uh, no baked stuff. Like pastries and stuff, you have to go to a pastry shop. So that, that's interesting. Um, but very different, very different than you would get. Uh, they put corn on pizza, so even the American food you get over there, like I've had pizzas with corn and shrimp. Like, oh, shrimp, I like shrimp. No, this shrimp had the head and the tail and the shell still on it, on the pizza, with the cheese over it. So it's like baked into the pizza with all the shell stuff. Like, you know, like what, what, I don't, like they read a book about pizza and had this idea, okay, I, pizza, <laughs> a round thing with stuff on top. We like shrimp, let's toss some shrimp on it. Uh, they never actually experienced a pizza. <laughs> that is the right way to do pizza, though. Just a, a dough, shrimp. just, and then whatever you like on it. Yeah, yeah. If you like right. it, put it on it. But very different. Just like Mexican food, Taco Bell is not Mexican food. Uh, if you want real Mexican food, go to the taco truck or go to uh, Dos Hermanos downtown. Go somewhere. They're actually Guatemalan, but uh, they make really good Mexican food. Um, it's, you know, very different. Great question. How about life expectancy? Life expectancy, I think, is pretty good. You know, overall, the diet's a little healthier. Like I said, they don't, they, they, they do a lot of steamed food a lot more vegetables than we do typically like me personally uh, I eat a lot of meat and uh, in, in Guangzhou in the south I wasn't as big of a fan of the food there because like dim sum you might have heard of that but they do these steamer trays that are about that big around they have like four little pieces of food that are bite-sized for really small people like for me like all four might be bite-sized and so like I would go to one of those restaurants and I'd be like okay I'll take uh, six of these like, <laughs> No, they come in sets of four. No, I mean six trays of these. Uh, four of these, five of those. Honey, what are you going to have? <laughs> like, yeah, I got some really funny looks down in Guangzhou because of the portion size. Like, they, they also don't have, like, the 79-ounce big dopes over there. When my wife first came here, we went to Sonic, and I got her what's called a Route 44. She's like, oh, my God, how many people are supposed to drink this? <laughs> No, that's for you. I <laughs> so, yeah, yeah, like the uh, the portion sizes and the style is different. The, the, the diet's a lot healthier, I think, in general. A lot of fried food, though. Um, plus, you know, there's not really nursing homes in China. That's one cultural difference. Families take care of the, the older people in their families. You, they, they won't send you to a nursing home unless there's no option. Like, you're going to go live with a family member. They're going to take care of you for your whole life. Um, really respect the elders. I, I should give a shout out. My parents in law are visiting from China. They're over there. They're too shy to come over here. My wife, my daughter, um, they, they were busy until question and answer time. So. But they really respect their elders there and, and they treat the older people pretty well. So, yeah. I know there are a lot of ethnic minority groups in China. Do they live much differently than the Han Chinese do? That's a good question, and uh, from my perspective, I mean, like my wife would probably answer that better. Um, no, <laughs> uh, it, like, because it's 2022, right? Like, we all have iPhones and computers, even, you know, th there are, like, cultural clothing and, and stuff that are unique to the different minorities, but, like, when they go home at night, it's like they turn on their TV, get out their iPhone, um, order some fast food, right? But but they do have a lot of like very neat cultures, and they do celebrate those. You can go to like 
uh, cultural parks, like that one picture I showed was kind of a cultural area for a minority group. And they, they still have their dances and their, their uh, traditions and their special foods. And they celebrate that, but it's a lot like, um, kind of like our Native American culture. At the end of the day, they're not living in teepees, right? You know, right. they're pretty modernized, not like you would think. I, I did kind of have that impression, like when I went to China, I was expecting people to be running around with rickshaws. That's that, like some really touristy places, maybe just because they can con people out of a lot of money. But most of you have bicycle taxis and motor bicycle taxis, which are cool. Um, but yeah, there's a lot of a lot of diverse cultures within Chinese society that you can explore, uh, for sure. Yeah, great, great question. Is it hard for your daughter and um, your wife to adapt? Yeah, yeah, it was hard for me to readapt. You know, there's such a thing as reverse culture shock. Like I spent ten years in China. I came back here and I went to buy a bottle of water and they're like two dollars. I'm like, what? what? <laughs> two dollars? It's water. I, uh, like that would cost me literally like like eight cents in China, um, so like the cost is vastly different. The the food is very different. Toilet paper. Restrooms don't have toilet paper in China. You you don't get free toilet paper anywhere. You carry your own toilet paper with you wherever you go. Like after being in China for five years, one of the first trips we took back when my wife was working on her visa, we went to came to L A because we had to get some stuff taken care of. And I'm like, hey, it's my birthday. Found out I could get into Disneyland for free. I went to Disneyland with a half a roll of toilet paper in my pocket. I went into the public toilets in Disneyland and I sat down, I'm like, oh wow, they have toilet paper for free. Nobody's yeah. stealing all of this? What the heck? Like, yeah, so that that's it's like one of those random cultural things that just catches you out of nowhere. But my daughter, when she came, I'm gonna brag on her a bit. I spoke English to her. She went to a school where she learned English, but it was from Chinese teachers. Um, 90% of the time at home, she was Chinese with, with, her, with her grandparents and with her mother. She spoke English with me. Her English wasn't great. She was reading, at like, reading and speaking at like a kindergarten level when she went into second grade here. And then uh, Mr. Belson, the guy that works at Jefferson Elementary with the ESL kids, he did a wonderful job with her. By the time she finished second grade, she was caught up. She was like at a third grade reading level after a year. Uh, now, she's in junior high, she's, she, she, like, by the time she was in fifth grade, she was in HAL, like the uh, high academic learners, like she was in the gifted program, and right now she's reading at like a senior level. Um, so, having that, that double language exposure from birth, I think it made her take off a little more slowly, but like the sky's the limit. Like, having that, the, having a more diverse experience in your childhood and learning multiple languages, that's the time to do it because I'm too old. I, I can speak one and a half languages. That's all my brain has to move for. If I try to speak Spanish, I used to know some, it comes out as Chinese and I get really funny looks. <laughs> so yeah, they adapted really well. My wife actually worked here. She teaches English. I met, she was an English teacher when I met her in China. Now she works at the uh, individualized English up in the language lab. So some of you know her. Um, my daughter's doing great. She's in junior high and like literally all of the activities they offer they, they, they love it here. My parents, they don't speak a word of English. Hi, Ma. Hi, Ma. They understood that. That's it. Um, awesome people. They're adapting. They figured out that they can ride. They rode their bikes from my home up in Woodland Park all the way to hy East. <laughs> and uh, they didn't tell us. They just waited until we were gone at work. And they just like, hey, let's get the bikes. And they went to hy and back and carried like gallons of milk back. I was like, jeez. <laughs> I couldn't do that. <laughs> they're six, in their 60s. But they're, they're awesome, and they've, they've adapted, they love North Fork, uh, they love the garden. Like, they're in a city of 8 million, they can't have a garden there. Our garden at home, we have a nice garden, and they go out there like for hours a day taking care of it. We have, we have wonderful tomatoes right now. So yeah, yeah, they've adapted. Wonderful questions. <laughs>